um, about leadership is that it's first and foremost just influence. It is our ability to influence other people. Um, and it doesn't matter whether that's in a, in a sales, in a business setting, or it's in a soccer setting, or quite honestly, uh, as a father, you know, trying to influence our kids, you know, to live a certain way, make certain decisions, not watch certain programs, you know, uh, that's, that's leadership. And how you go about influencing people, you know, to act a certain way, think a certain way, talk a certain way, that's leadership. Uh, that's leadership. And I, I had those lessons early in life. I'll talk to you, you know, about some of those uh, experiences I had. But I, when I was in grammar school, it started at a very young age. I was in grammar school, and I can remember I was at a Catholic school, St. Mary's Academy, and they had the lunch line, and at the beginning of the lunch line were these big, red, delicious apples. What, really, like, looked like they were right off the vine, freshly picked. And at the top of the, the stack was a sign that one of the nuns had written that said, uh, take only one, God is watching. <laughs> so, so I went down the line, and there was a little boy in front of me, and, and one of the leaders of the class, influential kid, and it, we're taking our, you know, our apple, and then we take our sandwich and our milk, and we get to the end of the line, and there's these... Freshly baked chocolate chip cookies. You could still smell them. You could probably, by the apples, you knew they were coming. To, they were that fresh. So the little boy in front of me writes a quick note using a crayon, sticks it on top of the cookies. And I didn't know what he was doing. I got to the end of the cookies, and the note said, Take all you want. God is watching the apples. <laughs> You know, even at a young age, you know, of understanding that watching, whether it's classmates or uh, parents or other coaches and watching them uh, influence others it is pretty powerful. I'll talk to you a couple of things um, uh, real quickly. I want to introduce uh, Chris. Um, he, he works with our soccer program and uh, does not get paid a dime. He's doing it simply for the experience. Um, we have a number of people that, that do that, and uh, how powerful that is, is that uh, people will in, invest their time. They will, the most valuable thing we have is our time. It's a great democracy of life, isn't it? Time. Is that everybody gets 24 hours a day. It doesn't matter whether you're the, the, the guy begging on the street or the President of the United States. We wake up and we all get 24 hours. It, it really is how we handle those 24 hours that dictates our success. It's the great democracy of life, and for us, and, and the beautiful, one of the beautiful things about the game of soccer, it's 90 minutes. <laughs> How do you manage that, right? How do you manage the 90 minutes dictates your success? How do you handle that? It teaches so many wonderful principles, and time is one of them, but what are you willing to do with your time, investing it, you know, and not getting compensated a dime for it, but because of the experience, maybe because of the association, you know, that he's willing to do that. And we so much value what he, he does for us. He, he gives much, much more than he gets. And um, we so much appreciate him being a part of our program. The other uh, person is Tina, my wife. And uh, the one lesson I can tell you is this, is if you're, if you're married or not, one of the greatest lessons I've learned in life is to partner well. It, it, there is no greater importance in life than making sure that you partner well in whatever you did. Um, I, was, I was fortunate enough to marry God's best. And, and because of that, my life has grown tremendously. And it's the most important partnership, but whether it's assistant coaches, whether it's interns, whoever it is, making sure you partner well, that association is so, so powerful. And uh, it's not something that we, you know, at a young age, and I, I'll be honest with you, at a young age, you know, the attraction to dating and things like that wasn't really thinking beyond, you know, that night maybe. But what I've come to learn is that partnership has meant everything, not only to, to my life, but our kids as well. So, uh, again, number one, number one principle, uh, when you're in business, when you're in life, Make sure you partner well. Make sure that you, uh, you pick God's best. Um, my, my progression 
to, to getting to here at the University of Louisville. And, and, and I don't know if, if you uh, uh, recognize it or, or realize it, but the University of Louisville right now, from an athletic standpoint, is at the pinnacle. And we're at the pinnacle because of leadership, because of a guy named Tom Jurich. Uh, he's the AD here, and it was his direction and his guidance over the number of years that has brought a certain number of people together that, um, quite honestly, have uh, lifted the athletic department and around the country. People are looking at us and saying, hey, what's going on? You know, because the success on the field is tremendous, and what they don't see is a lot of the successes that are going on here within uh, the university as well. But we're, we're at the pinnacle. So for me to be here and speaking with, to you is, is quite an honor. Uh, one, because I'm with the, the athletic department, but because I'm speaking to the, the business program, and the business program is regarded as one of the best in the country. And um, they continue to prepare people well for life after school. Uh, because because it's one thing to learn something here, but it's another thing to be prepared to be successful when you leave. And our business school here is one of the best in the country in doing that. So it's a great honor to be at a school where athletically, you know, it's a privilege to be here, but also speaking to a group like yourself is, is quite an honor. My progression, I, I started, uh, I, I played for a number of years, and when, when I got finished, like a lot of, what we see in football right now, because you played at a high level and played professionally, you think you can coach, <laughs> right? How many times do you see that? That, well, you know what, he was a really good player and they go right from playing right to the sidelines and, and coaching. And they lack the experience it takes. There's a, there's a great difference. I'll tell you, I'll tell you a quick story that, that it maybe translates for you as well. Went hunting one time and, and, uh, when I was in North Carolina and, and my first time hunting, I, I didn't experience it. My friend brought me and he brought, went through the hills in North Carolina, found a farm. And one of the things, we, we didn't have any dogs for hunting, hunting dogs. So we, we found a farm that rented them. And we, we went to the farm and uh, found the farmer. He came out and he said, yeah, we have dogs. We have actually what we consider, we think is the best dog in North Carolina. His name is, his name is Player. And, and he, he's tremendous. So we went out and I was a novice, but the guy I went with was a pretty good hunter. And we bagged more game than you could imagine. And he said, man, that was fabulous. So we booked it already leaving. We booked the next year. So we knew it was so good. Went back the next year and found the farmer and got the dog player. He was still available. Better than the year before. Third year, we go back again. And as we're approaching up, up the drive, we see the, the, the farmer there. And he's a bit sullen. And you can see his body language was saying that he, was, you know, he wasn't happy about something. So we got up there and we said, hey, we're back again. We had, the, you know, had our plans, reservation, his player available. He says, well, he's available, but I'm, I'm sorry, he's, you know, he's not he's not going to be very useful to you. And he said, what's the matter? He said, well, wonderful the experience. The last two years were great. What's going on? He said, well, he said, you know, right after you left last year, there was a group from New York that came up here. And he said, way went out hunting. And, and, and they started calling player coach. And ever since then, all, all he does is sit on his rear end and bark. <laughs> And we sometimes see that in coaching, is we think coaching is just, you know, barking out orders. <laughs> Where they make the transition from player to coach and they think that's it, but it's not. And, and for me, that was a tough adjustment, was going from actually playing the game and now leading a bunch of people. And I started at a school in, in North Carolina called Belmont Abbey College. It's a, a school with about a, a, a thousand students run by Benedictine monks. They actually have the monastery there on campus. They built the monastery with their hands from the clay. They actually made the bricks and built it over a hundred years ago. And they still wear the robes, you know, walking around campus. A very unique place. A very, very neat place. Um, but they pay in holy pictures there. You know, it wasn't a place you could stay very long. A blessing and holy pictures, they think you're good. You know, the money wasn't very good. So, so for, for Tina and I, it was, it was a wonderful experience. But, but me, as a head coach, I had no assistant. Now, think about this. My first head coaching experience, I had to line the fields. I had to cut the grass. 
I had to wash the uniforms, and I say I, I mean I. <laughs> there were many times I was lying in, lying in the field and Tina was on a tractor cutting the grass. <laughs> when we went on road trips, we had to take two vans. I can only drive one, there Tina was driving the other. What a wonderful experience it was. Fabulous. I look back on it, and from a coaching and development standpoint, it was probably the best time in my coaching development because I had to take ownership of it all. Everything reflected who we were. If the lines were crooked, I had to take responsibility for it. If the grass was high, I had to take responsibility for it. If the uniform smelled, we knew it. <laughs> the players told us, but we had to take responsibility for it. And all of that was a great life lesson for us. Because when we got to a place like here, where all of that is taken care of us, we have a greater appreciation for all it takes to make that happen. It was a wonderful time, and in fact, uh, Tina was such a big part of it that the third year I ended up getting a, an award for the NAI National Coach of the Year. We were uh, had a tremendous run and I come back from getting the award and we come back to the university and they give us a big reception the party and they end up giving Tina a, a plaque for the uh, Assistant Coach of the Year. <laughs> um, but again, partnering well and, and why that was, was such a, an important part. But I, I must also tell you that, that in the beginning stages I was coaching for survival. You know, it was, I, I didn't understand what leadership was, so the decisions I, I was making was really just to keep my, my head above water. You know, it was just enough to keep the thing moving in the right direction. There was enough passion and excitement to, to keep it going, but I really didn't understand what leadership was. And, and what happened was I had enough success that there was a Division I bigger school program, University of Akron, came calling. We ended up going to Akron for a little bit and, and still making the grade and learning a little bit more through the experiences, but still not really understanding what leadership was. In fact, we had a year where we underachieved. I thought we had pretty good talent, and, and we didn't reach the level that we should have. We didn't reach our potential, and I was very frustrated. I remember it clearly after the season, very frustrated that we didn't reach our potential and, and do what we expected to do and uh, put it off that we just didn't have good leadership within the team. The seniors, the, the upperclassmen, the, the older players, really didn't embrace that and lead us well. And then I read an article. There's a famous coach here, Coach K, Duke basketball. I went to Duke, and, and when I was there, famous, he was just starting, but became famous because of his ability to lead. So I was reading an article about him, and one of the questions I asked, I said, Coach K, you you have such great leaders. How do you find these guys with great character, with great focus, with great discipline? How do you find these guys? And he said, we don't find them. We develop them. And then it hit me that the reason why we didn't have great leaders was not because of them. It was because of me. And it was at that point I started to take the focus off of myself and started to put it on them, the players. I started understanding that their growth was the key. Their development was the key. It wasn't about my successes. It wasn't about the championship and the trophies and the next payday and, and what next job I could get. Because to that point, that's what I was focused on. It was a very selfish, very inner driven style of leading. It was about me. And it was interesting, as I took the focus off myself and I put it on the players, it was at that point my career took off. It was amazing how the successes came because I helped them grow. I helped them reach their potential. I helped them become more. And, and prior to coming here to the University of Louisville, we were the number one team in the country. And it grew to that point because of, again, focusing on others. 
I want to talk to you about five areas of leadership when you're focusing on others that are really critical. Five that we focus on, on here um, that I think are, are important to, to any leadership, and whether it's in a coaching profession or business or, or even in our household of, of leading our kids. There are five areas. The first and foremost is this, is, is to envision. Envision, to have an idea of where you're going. For, for any group to move from where you are right now, you have to have some idea of where you want to go. If not, it's kind of like this. It's kind of like you jump in a boat in a really active river and you push away from the shore. And, and you look around the boat and you see that there's no paddles or oars or rudders. And now the, the journey down the river is completely at the mercy of the river. And, and what happens when that happens? At some point, you look around and say, how did I ever get here? And this is no place I want to be. If we don't first start with an idea of where we want to go, the challenge is that we can end up anywhere. Now, I don't know about you, if you've gone, gone on vacation, one of the things here in the U.S. is you pack the van with the, with the kids and you head on vacation. I don't think for any of you, you've packed a car, packed your bags, gotten to the airport and saying, now where are we going? <laughs> <laughs> but, but the reality is this. The reality is this, is that most people will spend more time planning their vacations than they will the destination of their lives. <laughs> True. Having a clear vision, having a concise vision, and then writing it down on a piece of paper, being really clear with it. And the importance of this is, is, is as a leader, not only do you need the vision, but then you need to communicate that vision as well. You need to be able to also include the T in the vision. Because look, if it's just your vision, will they really take care of it? It's kind of like this. If, if any of you have gone on vacation and rented a car, how many of you have waxed and shined it before you brought it back? <laughs> yeah, why? Because it's, it's not yours. It's not yours. You're not going to take care of it. It's no big deal. So when you create that vision, it's so important that it's the group's vision. It's the team's vision. Because there is going to be a point where you're going to really want them to take care of it. There's going to be a point where there's going to be some challenges and obstacles to overcome. And if they don't have the investment in it, if they aren't a part of it, it's easy to quit. So it's so important that we create that. Christopher Columbus, on, on his uh, trip to the New World, um, he would get up every, every morning, walk to the front of the ship, and in great detail, look over the front of the ship and describe what the world was going to look like in great detail. And in anticipation, the rest of the ship, the guys would, would be out there doing this, you know, looking for it each and every morning because he created this beautiful, amazing place that they were headed to and they wanted to see if it was really there. That ability as a leader to convey it in our words and describe it and to bring the passion forward, the excitement to keep moving forward. We need to have the vision first and foremost. And I would also recommend this. We do this with our group. Is Not only do we create it, but we write it down. There's such significant power when you write your goals and put them down on a piece of paper. Why? Two reasons. One, there's an accountability to it. If you have it in your mind, there's a wish. When you put it down on a piece of paper, it, there's an accountability to it. The second thing it does is it starts programming your subconscious mind. You see, your subconscious mind is, is um, it's used to take care of things like your breathing, your heart beating, your blood flowing. It takes care of your immune system. And, and for the most part, it does it flawlessly. We 
which is pretty powerful. How do you program that part of your mind that is the most powerful part of your mind to help you move in a certain direction? Well, you do it by putting it down and feeding your subconscious mind every single day. You keep it in front of you. What happens is there's then this expectation, there's this anticipation. That's kind of what Christopher Columbus was doing in his words. It's kind of like this. Somebody, a, a friend of you buys a brand new red car, right? Buys a brand new red car, calls you up and says, I'm going to meet you on the corner of 3rd and Main in 10 minutes. And you hang up the phone, but you forget to ask him what kind of car. So what do you do? You go out to the corner of 3rd and Main, and there's a red car, but that's not his. And another one goes by, but that's not his. And pretty soon, car goes by, pulls up in his brand new red Mercedes Benz. <laughs> opens the door and says, how many blue cars came by? And you say, I have no idea. I, I wasn't looking for the blue cars. I, I can tell you exactly how many red cars came by. I was counting them. You were the eighth one. You, you see, when we put our goals down and put them in front of us on a regular basis, when we wake up in the morning, we're looking for the road sign. We're looking for the ways that they can happen. They give us that direction on a daily basis. They're our compass. We write them down and keep them in front of us on a regular basis. It's important for what we do as a team is that we're really sure that everybody understands what the team goals are, their participation, and then we keep them in front of them on a regular basis. <clears throat> There's a, I'll tell you, finish with one, one story about a guy who, who had these friends over a dinner party. And after the dinner party, he brings them into the living room. He says, I brought you over here really for one reason. I wanted to tell you a story. He said there was this young man who had a father who, who, who the father was a horse trainer, itinerant horse trainer. So he, 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 because of that job, had to move constantly. And his life was very disruptive constantly moving from city to city, place to place. You can imagine academically, different schools, different curriculums, different friends, different teachers. Because of that, academically, he wasn't very good. He didn't get very good grades until this one project, English project. The teacher said, write in great detail what your life was going to look like. He said, this is my, this is my one chance. I, I have this. I've seen it. I've done it. All week long, he writes in great detail in the paper. Of, of what it's going to look like. Hands in the paper on Friday, and all weekend long, he's thinking about this. You know, what? my chance for a good grade, he's excited, he's anticipating, Monday comes, the teacher's giving the papers back, and he gets back his paper, and he sees on top of his paper is this big red egg, and he's devastated. He, he, he can't believe it. So he walks up to the teacher afterwards and says, Teacher, I don't understand. Is it, is it the, the style? Is it the grammar? I, you know, I tried to do exactly what you wanted. Well, how come I got the F? And the teacher says, Well, I, I know who you are. I, I know you live in a trailer park. I know your family doesn't even own a car. I know you have to walk to school. And in this paper, you talk about living in a 10,000 square foot home on a 100 acre ranch surrounded by all those horses. He says, that's not realistic, but he said, look, if you want a good grade, if this really means something to you, you can take the paper home and rewrite it, and I'll grade it again. The boy took the paper home, and that night, he stayed up all night, brought the paper back the next day, and he brought it to the teacher, handed it in. The teacher looked at it, he says, I don't understand. This is the same paper I gave you. That's my F on the top. He said, teacher, I, did. I stayed up all night. I thought about it all night, and what I decided is, you can keep your F and I'm going to keep my dream. And the man said to the dinner party, I tell you that story as you sit in my 10,000 square foot home on my 100 acre ranch, surrounded by all my horses. And the paper I wrote, if you want to see it, is hung over my fireplace. It's a true story. You see the power of writing your goals down and keeping them in front of you on a regular basis it is a programming and a compass for us, for you, but also any team you lead. That is one, the first <coughs> principle of leadership is you have to create a vision. You have to create a destiny. 
The second thing is once you create the destiny is, is how, do you, how do you motivate that to keep going on a journey? And the second part of that is <coughs> encouragement. Encouragement. Proper and appropriate encouragement. Now, many times encouragement is, is, you know, is giving people what they want to hear, what they want. Encouragement is not necessarily what they want. Encouragement is giving people what they need. What they need. And it varies with the circumstances. Our words are so powerful in an encouragement. Our words have the ability to give life or take it away. We can help people in our words reach the highest level or drag them down to the lowest depths. There's a story about these black crabs in Hawaii, indigenous to Hawaii, they're a delicacy. And these black crabs are captured, barely surviving on the bottom of the bucket when one of them looks up. And he sees over the top of the bucket light. So he strains to get a claw up and he pulls himself up and he looks over the top of the bucket and he sees light. He, he sees the beach, he sees the ocean, he sees freedom, life. So he looks down to the rest of them and he says, you wouldn't believe what's up here. It's the beach, it's the ocean, it's life. And he puts his claw down to lift the rest of them up and the crabs all reach up and he drags them back down into the bucket. You, you see, there's, there's times in our lives because of the lack of self-image we have that rather than lifting people up, we drag them back down to where we are to make ourselves feel better. As leaders, we have that responsibility to lift people up to higher levels. Our words are so powerful in doing that. There's, there's a, a book called Whale Gone about how they train killer whales in SeaWorld. It's, it really is a quite interesting read. It's amazing. They take killer whales and Killer whales are the most dangerous predators in the sea. And what they do is they take these things, put them in captivity, and make them do whatever they want, which is pretty incredible. So if, if they want them to jump over a rope outside of the water, what they do is this. They put the rope about 10 meters off the bottom of the tank. And every time they swim over it, they love it and hug it and feed it. And, and then they raise the, the rope another 10 meters, and every time it swims over it, they love it and hug it. And pretty soon they have the rope 10 meters outside the water and this, this animal is jumping over it. Why? It wants to be loved and hugged and fed. <clears throat> now, now what they don't do when the, when the animal swims under it, what they don't do is whip it because they know they'll be eaten. <laughs> what they do is redirect the behavior so they can catch them jumping over it so they can love them, and hug them, and feed them. We're no different. The people we lead are no different. Our kids are no different. They want to be caught doing it right, and then to be loved, and hugged, and fed. In our words especially. When they're doing it wrong, redirect the behavior, so you can catch them doing it right. And again, not all of our words, not all of our words will be the loving, hugging, and feeding in the way that we think. We have a, uh, a player here, Marlon, Marlon Hairston, freshman here at school, very talented kid. So we're sitting at the beginning of this semester in January, we're writing his goals. And we're writing his goals down, and why? Why do I write them with him? Because I'm partnering. I, I want to know where he wants to go. I want to know where he's heading. If I'm partnering with him and I don't have an idea of where our players want to go and what they want to do in our lives, how can I help them? So we sit down at the table and we write the goals together. What do you want to do? So we're writing the goals of his achievements, what he wants to accomplish. The last thing he writes down, not my mind, his mind, I want to play for the under-20 national team. The challenge with that is this is that the under-20 national team had already picked their team for qualifying. So the only way you could possibly be involved was that if they qualified and then had the camps afterwards. So I said to Marlon, look, I know the coach. I know Tab, and look, I'll call on your behalf when they qualify. Sure enough, they qualify. 
But about five weeks into our training that semester, he was not good. His attitude was bad, he was cynical, he, he wasn't the hardest working guy. So I have to call him. I call him up on the phone after thinking about it. I say, Marlon, I gotta apologize. I, I gotta apologize because I told you I'd call on your behalf and there's no way Based on what you're doing, I can call because if I want to ever call him again and you show up the way you're playing right now, I will never be able to make that call again. I apologize, but I can't make the call. The next day in training, he was outstanding. And he was clearly our best guy the rest of the semester. Clearly. Like that. I had to make the call three weeks later. And he goes into the next camp, he does so well, they invite him to France, the tournament before Turkey, where they are right now. He gets injured and ultimately doesn't make the final cut. But the words of encouragement were, oh, you're wonderful, it's okay. The words of encouragement were, Marlon, that's not who you are. I know you and that's not you and you said you wanted to go here. That's not what it looks like. And that ability in our words and what we do to encourage other, give them what they not want, I can tell you, Marlon didn't want to hear that phone call on that day. I gave him what he needed. And it changed his life. Part of that is, one, partnering with them. The second is encouraging them. When we lead people, we have that responsibility to help them reach their potential that we need to encourage them. Now there's a third part of this that, that <laughs> probably goes missing more than anything else. And that is to enjoy the process. Enjoy the journey. We as leaders, and I know I've been in this, in this mode where we're so focused, we've created the vision, we got the vision, it's pretty clear, and we are so focused and driven that we forget to enjoy the process. And, and joy is not happiness. Happiness is based on circumstances. Happiness is temporary. It's dependent on you know, what, how much money I'm making, what job I have, what the weather is. Is somebody else in a good mood, bad mood? That's happiness. Joy transcends the circumstances. It's not just based on what's happening. It comes from the inside, but it's, 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 it's about the process. It's about enjoying the process, the journey. And that's a part, quite honestly, that goes missing so much. And, and what I know is this, and I've been in these, these circumstances before, that if you do not create a culture where there is an excitement and an enthusiasm and a clear joy about what you're doing, when those obstacles come, it makes it very easy to say no more. Not me. Not today. I think I'll find another route. Creating a culture and creating an environment where there is an enthusiasm, excitement, and a passion about it is so, so important for the group, as well as us individually, to keep moving in that direction. Because I promise you, there will be obstacles. I promise you there will be sacrifices needed to be made. Look, we, we have the guys running sprints and doing fitness work. And it's very easy in the middle of that when it's painful and hard and difficult to say no more. And I promise you in your business adventures there's always going to be a time where you're going to have to put in more time than you thought, go the extra mile, do a little bit more. And if there isn't that joy, enthusiasm, excitement and passion about it, it'll be very easy to say I'll find something else to do. It's the number one, number one reason why people quit their job. The work environment is the number one reason why they'll stay. For us, we know that. Look, we recruit very good players. We develop very good players, but if we made that environment one that didn't have joy in it, 
we know that they would be searching for another place to play. <coughs> Fast. The one thing I love about soccer as well is this. In a 90-minute game, our players have so many chances to make decisions. To make decisions. They have to make decisions over and over and over again. The beauty of that is, is this fourth part, is then we empower. Now we talk about coaches, and I've seen this, maybe you have on a youth level, where there's a coach standing on the sidelines, and he is shouting out every play, pass it there, dribble, shoot, defend, now everybody back, 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 now it's, and they're joysticking, it's like a video game. <laughs> they're joysticking everybody on the field, telling them what their next play is and decision is. The, the beautiful thing about the game of soccer is the kids get to make decisions. They get to make decisions. And our job as leaders is to empower them to do that. One is we want to prepare them for it, give them the skills necessary, help them develop, lead them. But when they have that time to make the decisions is empower them and say, go, oh, make the decisions. Because it's only in giving them, empowering them to make the decisions that they grow. Because afterwards, guess what? You get to reflect on it. Was it good or bad? Positive or negative? Should we do it again or not? And that empowering fosters their growth. And with their growth, the group moves in a much faster pace. <clears throat> But we as leaders have to be willing to let <coughs> go of that. How does that mean? <laughs> as, as leaders, we have to be willing to let go of that power. Because what I will tell you is this, that if you are making their decisions all the time, you will have to continue to make them. That if you don't allow them, for our children, if we don't give them some point that we allow them to make some decisions, we're going to have to make them forever. I know for our players on the field, I, I don't want them looking over and saying, what do I do next? Because they'll miss the next play. There was a, there was a, a time here at the, uh, at the University of Louisville. A big part of what we, we were doing was creating a culture, getting the culture right. Because we, we need to get the culture right if we were going to move forward. The expectation, I remember the first meeting saying, look, we have a standard, and everything we're going to do is of the highest standard. In fact, the rest of the programs here are going to look at us and say, that's the standard of excellence. And this was when we were 5, 10, and 3. I inherited a program that had never been to a, a playoff. Very few 500, and, and we knew the culture had to get right. So, you know, we, we talked about that and knew we had to get the culture right, one of the things we talked about was time. Was respecting each other's time, but managing that time well. So we had to empower them. So, so we, we said, look, if, if you don't show up at 8 o'clock a.m. when training starts, you miss the opportunity to train. Because it's a privilege to train. <coughs> and out of respect for everybody else's time, if you don't show up on time, guess what? You don't earn that opportunity. So one morning, about uh, 30 minutes before training in the locker room, and this is the day, it was a cold day, so we were training inside. We were training inside at um, the Traeger Center. So it's probably about a half a mile away, maybe a little bit less. Half an hour before, two of the players look over, and one of the players is in the area, in the locker room. So they quickly cell phone, OT. What's going on? OT wakes up. And Overslept, the alarm didn't go off, didn't know what, but he, woke up, he wakes up and goes, I, I don't know what happened. I, they said, look, what we're going to do is gather your stuff, we'll meet you in the middle of the quad, you can change there, and we, we can still make it to training in time. Empower them. You guys take responsibility for it. These guys were, they were wonderful. So they grab the stuff, they, they meet him in the middle of the quad, OT's like half awake, and OT puts his all stuff on. These two guys, Realize they forgot their own boots for training. So now they got to make it back to the locker room and up to Traeger in time for training. 
Joy T gets her stuff on and he heads. And I'm at this point I'm up at Traeger and I'm setting up for a training and I know what's going on. The other players coming in, they kinda of tell me. So I have an idea what's going on and I'm watching the clock, setting up, getting ready for training, and just before eight o'clock, the door opens. OT comes in and you can see he was running the whole way. So he comes in and he's looking at the clock as well. So he comes over, eight o'clock comes, we start training. We go through the beginning warm-up part, get the movement going. Sure enough, a little bit after eight, door opens again, and the other, and they come walking over in there. You can tell they were moving it as well. So OT is now really paying attention to what's going on. Two guys come over, and I say, look, I, I know what's going on. I know what's going on. You guys are late. Your responsibility now is to help facilitate training. You missed training today, but you pick up cones, vests, and everything like that. Now OT's body language is really slumped over. He's barely moving. You can see the guilt in his face. So we get through that part, and I, we, we start going into the functional part of training, and I'm setting that up real quick, and OT starts walking towards me. And I'm walking away. I don't want to talk to him. I go walk away, try to avoid him. <laughs> coach! Coach! He gets too close. I can't ignore him. <laughs> he said, OT, what's up? He said, it's not fair. I said, what are you talking about? He said, it's not fair. I should be the one not training today, not them. They're late because of me. And I said, OT, look, we have responsibilities. We have rules. The rules are you need to be here on time. You were here on time. Those guys were not. That's the way that's a rule. But, OT, what they've given you now is a gift. They've given you the gift of training today, and you're wasting that gift by feeling sorry for yourself. You have an opportunity and a responsibility to honor that gift by being everything you can become. And that's the only way you make what they've done worth it. He was clearly the best guy in training that day. So much so, he rose the level of training for everybody around him. But you see, that doesn't happen unless we empower them. We give them that opportunity to fail as well as rise. And we as leaders have to be willing to give up that power to make every single decision in their life. I'm not going to wake him up and take him out of bed to get him there to train me. I can't do it. Likewise, I'm not on the field to kick the ball for him. I can't do it. And if you're responsible for a group of people, you cannot take care of every one of their jobs. Your responsibility is help provide an environment where they have the skills necessary <coughs> to be successful. And then empower them to make the decisions they need to make. is power. And that's a part that's difficult. It was difficult for me to give up that, free, that, that power and delegate. But for you to lead a group, it is so, so important that we, we give that and, and, and honor that. Now, there, there, there was a, um, a, a gentleman, what, what, I, what I understood in that process was this, is for us to help them develop and acquire the skills that I had to offer them that opportunity by who I was and my growth as a person. There's a, there's a story about uh, Benjamin Zander. I don't know if you, you've ever watched TED, the TED Talks. They're wonderful. And if you ever get the chance, uh, pull up Benjamin Zander. He does a TED Talk that is absolutely phenomenal. And, and you think at first it's about classical music and he gets to the end of it. And he said, this is really interesting because he says when they, when they produce these CDs of these symphonies that I compose and I lead, I'm the director, I'm the conductor of this, he says, I don't play a note. And yet they put my picture on the front of the CD. He said, my role is to produce 
power, that give them power, that when they play the notes, they're playing them to the best of their ability. My role is to awaken in them their possibilities. And he said, I know I'm getting it right when our eyes are shining. He said, I know I'm awakening those possibilities. And he said, and this is powerful, when our eyes are not shiny, I then have to ask myself, who am I that their eyes are not shiny? Who am I that I am not inspiring in them? Who am I that I'm not awakening the possibilities in them? And this was a great paradox in my mind was I had learned as a leader that it wasn't about me. And my growth as a leader came when I started putting my eyes on them and helping them grow. But the paradox is this. It really was all about me. Be because if I didn't grow first, if I didn't become more first, I had nothing to offer them. I had nothing to pour out on them. If, if, if I was only a shot glass, I had very little to pour out. If my glass was big, I had so much to pour out on other people. Who am I? Who am I? And that's the great paradox of leadership. It's not about you, and yet it's all about you. And that's the final part of it. The fifth part is we need to embody it. We need to be. Gandhi said, we need to be the change we want to see in the world. What I know about my <coughs> team here is they're a direct reflection of who I am. What I know about any group that you will lead is they will be a direct reflection of who you are. You want them to be more disciplined? Guess what? You want them to be harder working? Guess what? You need to model it. It's very difficult for me to show up, quite honestly, 100 pounds overweight and ask our players to be fit. If we're on the road and I'm eating anything and I'm telling them for your own health and you got to eat certain ways, who am I? I have to be the model first. And in a leadership role, that's usually the hardest part because you push yourself out front. That's part of the responsibility. You're the guy out front, so guess what? Everybody gets to see you. You're exposed. And with that comes the heavy responsibility of who are you? What are your words? What are your actions? Who are you becoming? So yet, you have, to, you have to focus on their growth, but your growth has to happen first before you have anything to give them. And I'll let you in on, on my personal growth. And that happens through a couple of things. One, there's two things in life that dictate who we become more than anything else. Two things in life. One is who you associate with, hard and well. Because if you look at the five people, true, five people you hang around most, you look at the five people you hang around most, you're going to be right in the middle of those five in all areas of your life. Fact. It's, it's just fact. Some of you might be going, oh boy. <laughs> he didn't just say that. <laughs> Others, you might be going, yeah. But it's true. Association is critical. Mentorship. Find in your life somebody that can mentor you and somebody you can mentor. It's so important for your growth. So important. Find people where you want to be, that have what you want, that are where you want to be. Find them. Get around them. Take them to dinner. Take them to dinner, buy them dinner, and be quiet for two hours. <laughs> Mentorship. But you also need to mentor others because that's part of your responsibility. And when you're in a leadership role, part of that comes naturally. But take responsibility for the growth of other people as well. The second thing that dictates your growth as much as possible is, is reading. 
and and it's it's I I believe in it so much that um, that it, it's changed my life. There was a point years ago where part of a personal development system, business actually, um, and I'll, I'll try to do this in a quick story. Is is Tina and I were presented in a network marketing business years ago. And, and part of that business, they said, you, you aren't prepared to be successful in this, so what you need to do is grow. And the way you need to grow is there's a book of the month and a CD of the week. And Tina and I said, well, look, if we're going to do it and we're going to invest in it, we're going to do it, and I'm going to read it because I'm not going to spend the money and, and, and I'm going to listen to it. It changed my life. Like, I, I don't have enough time up here to tell you how much so. What I started doing was reading from good books, and, and I was a coach, but they were mostly business books, leadership books, self-help books, skills with people books. And, and it was amazing because what happened, this transformation, is, as I started taking these life lessons that I was reading on a regular basis, I started changing. I was a better husband, I was a better father, I was a better coach. And I understood what leadership really was. It changed my life. Now, let me tell you how, how much a day I, I invest in it. 15 minutes. 15 minutes a day? You, you would think, wow, I could probably find 15 minutes. I gotta tell you, I, I read at least a couple of books sitting on the toilet every year. But I find the time. Maybe too much information, maybe, but look. <laughs> you can find the time. 15 minutes. Why 15 minutes? Well, here. Most. Most chapters take about 15 minutes to read, yes? Probably, give or take five, a slow reader, maybe 20 minutes. Most books are 15 chapters long. How many books you get through in a month? Two. You do that for five years. How smart are you? For 15 minutes a day, what kind of investment is that? Are you kidding me, the payoff? on the investment for 15 minutes a day. And there are so many good books out there. So many. And what I found in my life is one good book kind of led me to the next. Because one good author talked about another book that influenced his life, that went to another one. And it was like I have stacks of books now on my dresser that I'm waiting there. But they're there, and I'm going to get through them 15 minutes a day. And I can't stop right now because of everything it's meant in my life. So, so as leaders, leaders are readers because they constantly are filling themselves back up so they have more to pour out on other people. And here's the interesting thing. Is it's not only going to change who you are as business people, it'll change who you are in your, in your everyday life. So those are the five principles. Hopefully you took notes, and here's the last thing I would, I would recommend. I know you're in a classroom and taking a note, <coughs> but one of the things I've learned is the power of journaling. I was once told the palest ink is more powerful than the best memory. That, that once we put it down on a piece of paper, it's there for, for life. Uh, if I commit it to my memory, oh boy. I'm not sure how long, but when I put it down on a piece of paper, I can go back and reflect on it. And, and quite honestly, it might mean something in something different in six months. Here's the greatest power. Check this out. Is I have stacks of these journals uh, it, it, at home, and, and quite honestly, they're in my library. The most important part of our house, the most important room of our house, is the library. Because what I know is this is. Is the information that I gained from the library, even if the house disappeared, I could build it again because of that information. And there is these stacks of, of journals I have. And there's going to be a, a point where I'm going to take the journal like this, and I'm going to go like this to my, my son. Now how powerful is that? That all those life lessons that I gained, I pass across the table to my son, my daughter, and say, Here, here's my life. Here's what I've learned. How many of you would like to have that journal from your parents? The life lessons, the meanings. You have that power. 
if you had 10 minutes a day to write down something about the day that took you that said, man, I wish I knew this when I was 16 years old. How powerful is that? So I highly recommend that you take that opportunity, not just when you're in class, because as I started out saying, they prepare you here well because it's not just about the classroom. It's about the things that happen outside of the classroom that they prepare you for what you're about to experience. So some of the greatest lessons in life come outside the classroom. Be prepared to capture them for your own sake, but also for your legacy. Super. And time for questions? Yes. Okay. And any questions that you might have. And I so much appreciate the opportunity to come in and share. It was, it was great, actually. Thank you very much. But uh, what, I, I miss one point the ethics. I'm honest, uh, because it's very powerful what, you, what you're what telling, but uh, there, there needs to be very strictly that, uh, that that's not used in the wrong way. Uh, and I, I so much appreciate it, because you're right, because leadership is not always positive. You know, some of, the, some of the greatest examples of leadership have been some of the most horrifying uh, things that have happened in our world. But powerful leadership has made that happen. And the ethics come back to, well, who am I? And they start with me first, is that I have to live my life right first. What example and what role model am I for one of my players? And I, uh, we, when we go on road trips, it is so important that when we can, I take my family with me on the road trips. Why? I love them. But most importantly, it is so important that the players see how I interact with them, that my words and actions are congruent. They line up in every situation. There's too many times that we have these spheres of influence in our life that we have this small fear that's our family. And outside of that are our close relationships. And outside of that are people that we meet. And outside of that is the rest of the world. And our actions vary depending on what sphere we're in. And they're not congruent. And then we better have a good memory to know what we did in each sphere. When you do it ethically, when you do it right, when you live your life in such a way that you don't have to remember what you said and what you did, there's a freedom in that. And, and that's what I would say about the ethical part of it. It is a freedom that comes with that to allow you to be everything you can become. <clears throat> of being right and doing things in the right way. There's a societal part of that that I wouldn't even touch on that I, I, in my own personal beliefs. But as far as leading people, there's a freedom when we do things right. And again, it starts with who I am first. My question, well, you talk about empowerment, that's a very powerful tool, but how do you set the limit? Because I think sometimes also the group expects that the leader takes a difficult decision. Because if you empower maybe too much, I don't know, then like the position of the leader is just like a council or not really, they can feel that the leader is really not interacting anymore or not taking responsibility. I don't know if that's the case, but... What a great question that is. Yeah. What a great question. And, and the reason why that's a great question is because that's the skill. That's the skill of coaching, is knowing how much line to let out, how much freedom you give. And, and, and I gotta tell you, my first, I feel sorry for my first song, because he was practice. <laughs> he was just practice, I had no idea. You know, my third one, I got, I got a better hold on it now. You know, and it's the same with coaching is now I have a better idea after, you know, 25 years of doing this, of where we can let the line out and when we have to pull it back in. And do we always get it right? No, but again, we have to be willing to let it out. The fear of not getting it right sometimes makes you want to hold it in and pull it in and keep it nice and tight, but, but with that, there is very little growth. I'd rather experience, maybe I let it out a little bit too far, all right, and maximize the growth and keep it too tight and, you know, 
piddle along, not going very fast. So that's the art of coaching, though, is that discernment of really, it starts with knowing the people as well. I knew I could call Marlon. I knew I could call Marlon and say, look, I can't call because I knew he'd be able to take that. I knew he'd receive it. And he also, I knew it was honest. And you talk about ethics, it's about being honest, truthful. You know, and that's, you know, that's a big part of it is knowing the people that you're, you're in charge of or you're working with. Yes? Yeah, and you know the, the difference between manager and leader, and and it, I, I think in any position we are in life, we have the ability to lead and influence because it goes back to influence. So e even for for me, although. Um, uh, Julie Herman, who was just here, was the one that oversaw saw my program. I still had the ability to influence Julie in, in many ways. So we, we don't just lead down, we can lead up and sideways across. We have that ability to influence. Now what gives us the right, what gives us the power to influence is really who we are, our, our character. Because if I have something to offer somebody else, whether as a manager or the owner of the business, people will receive it if I have something to offer them. Part of that is a vision. Maybe it is a vision. Maybe it's just, hey, you know what? I think there might be a better way to do this. Or it might be, hey, is there something going on at home because you're just not right here today? What is it? And it might be just listening. So how do we influence others? And again, I, I think we all have that. In fact, I think that's one of the things in our society here in the U.S. We have people that aren't willing to step forward and be quite enough. And we're waiting for somebody else to solve issues that we can take responsibility for ourselves. Hopefully that answered your question. When you have a look at you and your team, how do you interact or behave as a leader? Are you really close to your team or kind of yeah, the, the coach, the boss, the alpha, animal? <laughs> yeah. How do you behave? Yeah. Um, first, first and foremost, uh, it's important that I have a relationship with it. I know who they are. Now, I, I'm not going to be their best friend. <clears throat> I, I understand that. But I also want them to be able to come to me if they have issues in soccer or in life. If they feel there's a barrier that they cannot come to talk to me about, then I can't help them. Now my, my ability to influence is, is limited. So there is, there is a separation because I cannot be on that same line with them. There's a certain amount of respect that I must have for them, they must have for me. Um, but again, I think more than anything else, it starts with knowing who they are. One of the things we do is we ask them, well, we want to know, make sure we know who your parents are, what their names, how many siblings you are. We sit down and, and write down their goals with them. So we want to know who they are. And, and quite honestly, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And, and that's where it all starts is more than anything else, we need, to, we need to show them that we care, not just from a soccer standpoint and results, but outside of that as well. In fact, and it starts in the recruiting process, we tell our guys that, that our commitment to them, when they come here, they usually are in school for four years. We tell them our commitment to them is not for four years, it's a lifetime commitment. That well after they're gone, we're still having conversations with them. And that still happens. We, we want to be there for the rest of their lives and not just for the four years they're here. That's the part of it, I think, that is so critical in, in having uh, an influence. Yeah, would you say or would you agree that it's also important um, to know the limitations of uh, each other in the crew? 
So you talked about mostly about you know empowering, and I agree with it. It's, it's, um, yeah, it's very important too. But I, uh, in my opinion, um, mostly or most leaders um, forget about uh, respecting the limitations of um, um, yeah, special group members. Of, and um, so it's, um, how to say, um, yeah, you need um, also to know these um, limitations to um, empowering maybe um, these people in another way. So important, so important, and, and, and what happens is when you say somebody has limitations, what you're also saying in the same sentence is they have gifts, yeah. special abilities. So for me as a, as a coach and a leader, I have to maximize the, their gifts. My, I feel so strongly about this that my wife and I, we, we wrote a book, a children's book called Finding Your Gifts. And, and it's a soccer story. It's a story I told my son when he was, my first son when he was two years old, and told him over and over again. And it's just about, a, 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 basically it's a giraffe that doesn't get invited to play soccer because it's hard to even talk to him, he's so tall, right? And he's got long legs and he can't play, can hardly even move, but he ends, he ends up getting in, in the championship game against the biggest team they ever saw, Amazon Soccer Club, and now he's dominating in the air. And they end up winning because he's dominating in the air. He thought, well, yes, gift. <clears throat> Something special. It's about finding each other's <clears throat> gifts. Certain limits. We all have limitations, but as a leader, can you find the gifts and maximize those gifts and find ways that they can help? That's an important part of recognizing, you know, why what makes each one of us special. Question: You spoke at the beginning. Uh, have an idea, have an invasion, write it down. <coughs> so when I see, also as a leader, that I can't reach these goals, what? How should I behave? What is your recommendation? If I can't reach these goals, well, should I rearrange it? Or? Here's here's why we set goals. This this is my view of why we set goals in the first place. We'll we'll sit down at the beginning of the season. And we'll set a goal to win a national championship. And it's not just mine. We talk to the players and they say, absolutely. We should be the best team in the country. We sit there, and when we sit there and we set that goal, what I know for sure is this team that we have right now, before we'll start in August, quite honestly, we're not capable of. We're not, we're not capable of. Now, the only way we can get there then is how? We have to change and grow and become somebody different. So when in December this year, when we have that trophy over our head, they're kissing it. See, the, the payoff isn't the trophy and the championship. The payoff is who we become in the process. The trophy's going to rust. In 10 years, they may not remember who won it. But who they become is forever. And that's why we set the goals. It, is it, look, that we hit it? Or is it one of those things that has forced us to strive to go beyond where we are, that we're motivated to do something different, to sacrifice, <coughs> to change who we are, to get there, that ends up being the payoff? And I understand in the business world, there's a bottom line. There's a bottom line and you have to be aware of it. One of the, one of the most dangerous things though is to s set a goal and easily hit it. Because we don't stretch ourselves. So it's that, it's that, it's the discernment, the balance of we got to set the bar so we do have to stretch and grow and and if you're not hitting it, it is like we do every year. We come back and reassess and say, where do we fail? Where do we need to improve? Where do we have to grow more? Because next year, we're going to make sure that we're making a strides. Does that help? In the beginning of your speech, um, I think you have asked a very interesting question. You have said, just because you play professionally, do you think you can coach? And I think this is actually what happens in business a lot of times that you're good at what you're doing and then you get promoted and then you have a team of people that you should lead and coach and 
then you get, you know, it's, it's just difficult because then also you said, yeah, you have to grow yourself before, before you are able to make other people grow. So do you have a recommendation how you can manage this transition, you know, into growing yourself so you are able to lead other people? Yes, the, the first, the fastest way is through mentorship. We can, we can, and you get into that situation I experienced at Belmont Abbey. We, we grow in two ways. We can learn from our own mistakes, and that's painful and slow. <laughs> Don't enjoy that. <coughs> or we can learn from somebody else's mistakes, which accelerates our growth. So that's why mentorship is so powerful is that you can bring in somebody who has years of experience and say, okay, I remember my first day on the job. Here's what you need to do. I can remember having a situation where there was a disgruntle and he didn't agree with the vision and this is how you handle it. That coupled with the reading, and I would say this right now, if you don't find yourself in a, in a position of leadership, start preparing yourself for that moment. Don't wait till it happens. Yes. So do you think leadership is something that you can learn? Or other persons, they have it, they have this ability and there are other persons, they just don't. So they can try hard, but they somehow can't succeed. Good, good question. And it, it, is, it is a skill. It is something. Some people are, are um, more apt in their personality, maybe outgoing, maybe uh, a little bit clearer, maybe um, strong, you know, in, in who they are, self-confident, that they have that uh, natural ability. But in, in managing and working and skill with people, it is skill with people. It's a learned process. It is most definitely learned. And it's through years of being in position that I have that I've learned to be better at it. You know, and um, like anything else, the more you do it, the better you'll get. So I, I think it is a, a skill, yes. You also talk about mentoring, which I think is a very important thing, but how do you find a good mentor? Well, uh, you know what, it's, it's uh, one of those things that it's, um, it's searching out, it, it, it's knowing first and foremost what you're looking for. You know, it's, kind, it's kind of like when we tell kids here, we're going through the process, we ask them five specific questions. One of the questions is we said, Look, what is your priority for picking a school? Because if their priorities don't line up with us, then you know I would first want to tell them, this is not the school for you. So it starts with saying, okay, what is it that I'm looking for? You know, what is it that that I want in my life? You know, professionally and personally, and who is exemplifying that? Who has that right now? Who has the fruit on the trees right now? And those are the people that I want to be associated with. And then, look, be forward about it. Send them an email. Send her an email. Call them. I'd like to take you to lunch. I've had many people call and say, look, can I just come to the office? I want to sit and ask you a few questions. And I welcome it. And what I, what I know about successful people, they want to tell you how they were successful. <laughs> they want to tell you. Can you ask them. Yeah. Is your mentor? I had different mentors in different areas. For writing a book, I've had a different mentor. For coaching, it started as Bruce Arena, uh, who was a national team coach at one point. Before he was a national team coach, I was going to watch him work. Um, speaking, I have another another mentor. So in, in different areas of my life, personally, you know, different mentors. It doesn't have to be one for everything. You can have mentors in different areas of your life. There are people that, again, have certain gifts that you want to tap into. What is your personal motivation at the moment not in a role as a, as a leader, as a coach, more in a role as a team member? And did it change since you started with the job? Absolutely. Absolutely. When I first started, it was about me. It was clearly about me. It was about um, what position, because my self-image was wrapped up in my own success. My self-image was based on, well, what was our record this year, and um, did we win uh, championships, and you know, how much money was I making? And I was wrapped up in that. Right now, for Tina and I, our mission is to simply pass on principles of success. That's why I'm here today, is because we're passionate about passing on things that we've learned that have helped us grow, things that have made a difference in our lives, 
<clears throat> to help enhance the lives of others. What's happened in my life is I've, I've now, we've created a platform. Because of our success here at the University of Louisville, there's this platform that Bruce will then ask me to speak to you. With that platform, now I have a responsibility of using it appropriately to enhance other people's lives. That's why we wrote the book. It's how many people can we pass on the principles through. You talked about developing people and empowering people to achieve the team's goals. But how do you manage a situation when you realize that a team member is empowered a big team, is a great leader for the team, and achieves the team goals, but you realize that he would even do better somewhere else? Mm. Because I imagine that you would need that team member in your team mm. to achieve your goals, but still realize maybe the person would be better off somewhere else. How do you manage that? It's a, it's a great question. We had uh, a player this year called Andrew Farrell. Andrew Farrell was in his third year. As you know, it takes four years to graduate. They can play four years of, of soccer here for us. No more than four years. He was in his third year. He was ready to move on to play professional soccer. And we said, look, you're ready. And, and, and the MLS, which is the league here in the US, they enticed him enough financially that we said, look, it's time for you to move on. He'll, he'll continue his education from a distance. But we realized that for him to stay here wasn't the best thing for his growth, personally and professionally. So we said, look, wouldn't we love to have him? He was one of the best players in the country. He was the number one draft choice over everybody in the country. Wouldn't we love to have him? Absolutely. But it was also one of the things where we said, OK, it's, it's time for you. You need to move on. So you're saying you always have to let go and let people go and feel that they are better off well, they would certainly help us achieve our goals, but his growth wouldn't have been maximized. And, and again, we're constantly, we're, we're the, the focus of each person and helping them reach their potential. When they come in, we talk to them about that, and our, our, our focus is helping them reach their potential. And if we were to keep him here, that wouldn't have been honest. You know, his potential, he needed to be at a different level with professional players on a regular basis. So we need to keep moving them on. It's kind of like our kids as well. I love my kids, but at some point I'm going to say, you know what? I think it's a bit difficult for a manager's perspective in a business environment because uh, sometimes they're really glad you have good people and then you just uh, yeah, develop them and let them go. It, it is. It's, it's hard, but here's the, here's the thing that we've come to know. There's another person. There's somebody else that's going to come, and our responsibility is to know who that next person is. You know, as leaders, we have to—we can't be so naive to think that people aren't going to be moving on. Our responsibility is to know who the next person is when they do, and start cultivating that and developing that now, that we don't get caught going, "Oh boy, now what do I do?" Because then we're not prepared. So we push them on, and then help the next one grow. So when you let him leave, didn't you teach him also to only think about his, his own profit instead of the group profit? Because that's, you said you changed yourself not thinking about yourself anymore, but if you say to someone, now you need to go to develop yourself more, then he's also somehow taught to think only about himself. How can you uh, arrange this later on? That's and a good question. That's a, wonderful, yeah, it's a wonderful question because there's two dynamics working. One is what we know is for the team to reach their success. For the team to reach, each one of us has to grow more. Each one of the players has to reach their potential for the team to reach its fullest potential. So what we have to do within that is help them, motivate them to become better. Help them grow for the good of the group. And that's the dynamic, that's the balance of it is, look, we have to help each one keep shepherding them. You know, what are, what are your goals, Marlon? Do you want to play in under 20 national? I want to help him get that because you know what? His experience with the 20s, when he comes back, it's going to help us. We'll be a better team. And that's, that's part of it is that we have to help them grow individually, knowing that when they grow individually, they have more to offer the group and the team. And it's keeping the focus, and that's the, that's the important part of it, is, is again, within the culture of what we do, of understanding that we'll continue to grow. Why? To help each other. 
and we're all here. When we, when we help each other, we all end up benefiting more. Um, regarding uh, the goals you achieve, or uh, to set them as, not, not as high as possible, but uh, as high that the, the people can reach it, what would you t uh, uh, tell the players of Bayern Munich? They reach everything now, <laughs> more or less. How to, for, as an expo. Can you do it three years in a row? <laughs> <laughs> Who's done it two years in a row? Okay. Who's won to travel two years in a row? Ooh. And now with Pepe in here, you know, you, uh, you got to believe he's feeding them, hey, look, you know what? Who's done it twice? <coughs> so there's always, believe me, I, I've already had that speech in my mind ready for when we win a national championship. <laughs> <laughs> some clubs around Europe that have some kind of rich person that um, buys a lot of good players and in the end they wonder why they are not successful and um, I think there's some kind of missing of the points that you said like motivating them, empowering them and so on. Um, if we link this to the business world, what's the right balance between spending money, hiring people and empowering their own people? And I give the Bundesliga a lot of credit because they're fiscally responsible. There's not too many leagues in the world that handle it quite like Germany does. That, that at the end of the year, your books have to balance. It's the way it should be, shouldn't it? You should run your league in a way that, that your books, and not, not in a way where uh, at Man City, the owner um, you know, buys advertising for you know, $100 billion and they use that back into the budget. That doesn't, that's not fair. That's not right. You know, so in the end, your book should balance. So I give the Bundesliga a lot of credit for that. And I think in the end, that's the way it should be, is look, it, it, you know what, you are running a business. So the numbers do matter. So from a standpoint, at the end of the day, results matter. They do matter. How do, how do we know we're growing? How do we know we're reaching our potential? The results will tell us. Many times we'll know if we're hitting it. And I think it's misleading when you see teams like Manchester City and Chelsea and they're just buying players, that there really isn't a cultivation going on. There isn't a development going on. Um, and it's quite honestly, it's ruining the EPL. How do you manage conflict? Because even though people would like to, to, to think as a group, the, the crime is that they think individually. And everybody wants to show so they can be transfer to uh, upper teams or the professional league. How do you manage that conflict when, when it arrives? Wonderful question. There's a great book called The Five Dysfunctions of a Team. If you haven't read it, I would read it. And one of the premises of the book is, is first and foremost, you have to start from a, a level of trust. If you have trust within the group, and the trust is this, the trust is that we're all working towards the same goals, that we all have that, that same vision in mind, when conflict arises, it's knowing that we're all have, we have different views, but it's because we believe that we're, this will help us move in that direction. If you don't have trust, when conflict happens, now you're going, I, I'm not sure he's doing it for our best interest. Conflict is not always bad. Conflict many times can be good if we're, if we're working to get in a certain direction and we trust that we're all working in that way. Ultimately, when conflict happens, there's going to have to be a decision made, though. I, I think we should go in that direction. I think we should take that path. Well, we got to understand why that way and that way, but in the end, there's going to be a decision. Clearly, it's important that everybody's involved in the decision part as much as possible. But then when a decision's made and you leave the room, that we're all on the same page going whatever direction we decide. And again, that's, that's one of the most important things as a leader, is that influence to say, okay, look, we're all on the same page. We decide to go in that direction. Let's move it. And there's not somebody going, but I thought we should, because then it drags everybody back. And if we have somebody dragging back and not willing to go, there might have to be a separation. 
I experience uh, self-development and self-education in a team as the most important part of the team. <coughs> so I would be interested uh, yeah, how you support this process. Uh, do you just use or just use your vision or do you as well use uh, some tiny punishment mechanisms? Mm -hmm. So um, I remember I, uh, one, of, one of the persons I admire the most is uh, my former trainer. So he was a national player in handball and so on, he was my trainer afterward, and he used uh, such tiny things like sit-ups or push-ups, just uh, that nobody wants to do it yeah. uh, in training. Yeah. So, but it keeps, it keeps it together because you will educate the other players, act like the trainer uh, wants to in this uh, situation, so we all don't need to be punished. It's, it's a good question. It's a good question. For, for us, we, we tend to use the positive and the motivation aspect. In the in in development of the players, I'll feed them reading material. Um, I sent them a, sent them a quote um, earlier today, and I've gotten receiving text back you know, from them of thank you for the quote. <coughs> uh, emails, I'll send them emails, things to read, things like that. But even from a standpoint of reinforcing behavior, video. We'll show them video after games. We'll show 75% of what we show is them doing it right. 25% is what went wrong. And not to say, you know, you, you know, how come, you know, what you, you should, but this is not the way, this is what we want it to look like. So this is what we need to change. But what we put into their minds is, is again, 75% of what went well. What it should look like to reinforce that, not 75% of what went wrong, because guess what, they're seeing that. Those images, the visuals are powerful. So we, again, it's the same thing on the field, is when they're doing it right, if it's not right, we say, hey look, this is the way it should look. That's not the way, and you know, this, we saw this, and now it's changing, and when they get it right, we tell them. We do look at the end of uh, possession games, uh, three minutes, uh, seven passes is a goal. Do we have, and this is more from a competitive standpoint, losers do five push-ups. You know, but it's not necessarily to say, you know, you weren't good enough. It's like a competitive, fun thing. You know, always want to have something on the line. You know, and it's something small like that. Does that help? Yeah, it helps. So I experienced when, when, when I was young, it was more uh, punishment for education. So, but when we were, when we grow older, um, it was like this more fun. Yes. So look, and we want to create an atmosphere where they're driven. Look, we're we're very driven to be successful, but we feel like the, the philosophy of what we do and how we do it is not to whip them, you know, but to love and hug and feed them. Two more questions. Two more. <laughs> <laughs> first and foremost is can you influence up? Can you, can you add? Maybe my boss, but not the, the owner of our company. Right, and, and if that's not the case, then you have to ask yourself, is an environment that you want to work? Is an environment that I want to be a part of? And, and you know, the one thing I would, I would tell all of you is wherever you are, whatever you're doing, enjoy it. Life is way too short to put yourself in an environment because again you find yourself somewhere down the line because you stay in it because of maybe the security of the money and you don't have your own self compass you know directed that you look around at some point you're 40 years old you're in this job and you're hating it and you go how did I ever get here and this is no place I want to be so each day you have to have an understanding of look what do you what is your what do you want you know what is your compass you know and does it align with this company that I'm working for the people that I'm involved with and 
it's not so easy to jump around, I understand that, but ultimately you have to ask that question to yourself. If, if their goals and my goals don't align, is this the right place? Well, again, it's the question of conflict. You know, that, that you say, hey, look, I'm doing it because I think it's the best for the, for the group, but that doesn't line up. Then you move forward and, and inspire and, and influence the people as much as possible to, to reach the goal, you know. Uh, and then the next project, you know, the same. If you find project after project that's happening, I might tell you something. One more. Back, back here. Yes, I got the last one. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's very obvious that you are very passionate about soccer. Yet, as far as I know, uh, soccer is not that popular in the U.S. I think this can be very challenging in several ways. How do you deal with that for yourself and with the team? Well, one, it, it, is, it is growing. The popularity is growing. The MLS is helping that. Um, uh, it looks like our national team will qualify for Brazil as well, which that is very important um, for the ongoing growth of it and awareness. Um, look, where, where we are, we have our, our own challenges. There's no, no question. It doesn't matter whether you're um, the NBA, the NFL, um, there's, there's more growth to be had there. And I think it's a wonderful time. It is a magnificent time to be part of the growth of soccer in this country because it is taking off. So to be in the midst of that and being part of that culture and the growth of it is exciting you know, for me right now. Where I am right now, we're helping that. We're just building a new stadium here. 5,500 uh, 5, people. It will be the best college soccer stadium in the country. And why? Because we've had games where we've had 7,000 people at a college soccer game. So it is growing. We are doing it. And right now we're taking care of Louisville, you know, growing the sport here and knowing that when that happens, it will have a big impact elsewhere as well. So it's an exciting time for soccer, and there is some challenges because it isn't quite as popular as the other sports, but we're, getting, we're making it. But I think the team member maybe get, um, would get some more credit for different kind of sports like American football with the same performance. Could. So how, could. How can you deal with that? Yeah, you could. Yeah, for, sh for sure. Not, <coughs> not only more recognition, more money. Look, if you're playing professional football or, or, um, or basketball, or even baseball, the payoff is significantly more. Um, but it, it starts with, again, following your passion, you know, following your desire. And more than anything else, we start at the grassroots. We get them when they're six years old, and when they leave our clinic, we want them going, that was so much fun. I can't wait to go back. And that's the part where we cultivate that joy and enthusiasm and passion. And because of that, they stay with it even more. That's why our country is getting better. We'll get there. We'll, I don't know if we'll beat Germany in the next World Cup, but you know, we're, we're making headway. We're making headway. Thank you so much. I appreciate it.